Welcome to lesson number 33 of Luther's Small Catechism. Today we're looking at the visible church. Let's get into the third article. I believe of the, in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot by my own thinking or choosing believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and fully forgives all sins to me and all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. Number one, the word church is used when referring to the holy Christian church, that is, all people everywhere in heaven and on earth who believe in Jesus as Savior. Why is the word church also used when referring to a local congregation? And then what's the key difference between membership in the Holy Christian Church and in that of a local congregation? So why do we use the word church when we're talking about a local congregation? Because Local congregations are often called churches because the Holy Spirit leads believers by using the gospel to and, and calls them to assemble with other congregations. So if you're part of the Holy Christian Church, that is if you're a believer, you want to gather together with, with other believers in one location. So that is a local church. But what's the difference between a local church, the visible church, and the holy Christian church, the invisible church? In the invisible church, everyone's a believer. In the visible church, we don't know if everyone's a believer because we can't read hearts. So there can be hypocrites that belong to a church, but they actually don't believe in Jesus. Number two, St. John wrote, test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Why will we want to examine a congregation's doctrinal statements before joining it? And why will we also want to examine a congregation's practices? So we want to make sure that a congregational statements of their faith actually agree with what the Bible says. And then we want to go a step further and say, does their practices actually do that too? Because you can say one thing and do another. So God says, that we want to be part of a church that both teaches the truth and practices the truth as well. Number three, when we find a congregation that is faithful to God's word in doctrine and true practice, that is an Orthodox church, the word Orthodox means like a straight teaching, God wants us to join in fellowship with it. According to the following passages, how do like-minded Christians express their fellowship with one another? Acts 2.42, the early Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So how did like-minded Christians express their fellowship in Acts 2? Well, they taught God's word, right, the apostles' teaching. They joined together in fellowship. They did things together. They broke bread, seems to be referring to the Lord's Supper, and they also prayed together. So these are different ways in which a congregation shows that they are united in their doctrinal teachings and their doctrinal practices. What else? Acts 13, verse 2 and 3. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, the church in Antioch placed their hands on them and sent them off. So what else do believers do when they are assembled together to express their fellowship with each other? Well, they call men to be their leaders. And in this case, in Acts 13, they called missionaries to go and do mission work on their behalf. We all can't go to different parts of the world and be missionaries. It's just not possible. It's not fiscally possible. Uh, and we all have different responsibilities. So what do we do? We pool our money together and we send people on our behalf. What else do congregations do to express their fellowship with each other? John 21, verse 15, Jesus said, feed my lamb. So a big part of belonging to a church, assembling together as believers is training the next 
generation to carry on God's word. Number four, St. Paul warned, watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. In other words, God's word. Keep away from them. According to Paul, what causes divisions in the Christian church? What causes divisions are those who teach false teachings. Next question says, how does separation from those who adhere to false doctrine, that is heterodox churches, demonstrate a love for God and his word? So by keeping away from those who teach false doctrine, how are we actually showing love for God and his word? We don't want anyone to lie about God's word. So we want to stay away from those who lie about God's word. If we would join in with those who lie about God's word, we would be sharing in their sin. We would be sharing in their lie. How does that demonstrate a love for our own souls? We don't want to be taken aback by error because often one error leads to another area. In fact, if you study the history of churches and denominations uh, across the world, but even just in the life of the United States, you'll find that one little small doctrinal error turns into another and turns into another, and eventually the gospel is lost. And how does that practice of keeping away from those who teach false doctrine, a love for the souls of those in heterodox churches. We don't want to give the idea that, well, it doesn't really matter what you believe and what you teach because, eh, you know, we're all Christians. No, we, we want people to know that teaching false doctrine is serious and it's a serious sin that we don't condone. Number five, refusing to to fellowship with heterodox churches is not only a doctrinal issue, but a confessionally practical one as well. Why would it be confessionally impractical to engage in joint worship services with a heterodox church? So, you know, why doesn't our local Wells Church just join in with the Baptist Church down the street for that and have a big Easter celebration or a big Christmas celebration? Because by doing that, we would have to compromise the truth of God's word. And what would we teach? The best that we could do would be to agree to disagree. But that is not what God says about his word. Why would it be impractical to jointly support the Christian education of our children? Well, again, what would we teach? We would have to compromise or we would have to stay away from teaching certain topics if we decided, well, let's just teach a Christian Christian uh, school, well, what would we teach if we all don't agree on what the Bible says? And then supporting mission work together uh, would also be impractical because then once again, what would we teach if we're not going to teach fully God's word? Number six, some agree or disagree questions. People in heterodox churches will still go to heaven. All those who believe in Jesus Christ will go to heaven. That is the great blessing. That's the comfort we take. That doesn't mean, though, that this side of heaven, that we can be fully united with those who are in heterodox churches because we cannot tolerate false teaching and lying about God's word. But we're thankful still that we will be full brothers and sisters in the faith once we get to heaven. Next statement, agree or disagree. The wells, that is our synod, causes divisions in the Christian church by refusing to fellowship with churches that are not in doctrinal agreement with it. This is what the Wells gets accused of quite a bit from other church bodies, that we are the ones who are divisive. Um, but that's not true. The Wells isn't forcing other churches to teach false doctrine and stray from God's word. In fact, by not being in fellowship with other churches that teach false doctrine, we're showing a love to them because we don't want them to continue to teach those things. And then third statement's a tricky one. It can be a hard one. Agree or disagree? It's better to join a heterodox church than none at all. This can be a very hard and a practical question to answer and life situation to answer. But there's other ways of kind of phrasing this that put it into a bit clearer perspective. It's bad to drink poison, right? We get that. We don't want to drink any poison that will kill us. Would you be willing to drink a little bit of poison, even if it doesn't kill you? Well, of course not. I don't want to drink any poison. I don't want to get sick by drinking poison, even if I know it's not going to kill me. Well, how much false doctrine am I willing to put up with? 
if, if it means that my soul won't be destroyed. Okay, will I put up with a little bit of false doctrine or maybe half false doctrine? Uh, no, I don't want to put up with any false doctrine. Often, God uses people who are put into a situation where there are no, no Orthodox churches around to start a new church. In fact, that's how a lot of our Wells churches have started. People have looked around and said, there's no church that teaches the truth. We need somebody to do that here. And a church is formed. What did Luther say? He uses a picture from scripture that is used a lot. The idea of yeast in dough. Luther wrote, you hear that St. Paul would not mix even a small quantity of yeast, that is false doctrine, with the good dough. God had forbidden it, for it works its way through and through and corrupts everything. Where in one point we mingle the correct pure doctrine with human additions, the injury is done. The truth is thereby obscured, and souls are led astray. Let's close with prayer. Lord God, spare us from false teachings and teachers. In your mercy, bless our church and synod so that they may ever be guardians and messengers of your truth for the salvation of many souls. In our Savior's name, we ask this. Amen. Homework for next time. Continue to memorize the third article and Martin Luther's explanation. And then read the book, or you can also find this on wells.net, W-E-L-S.net. Read the This We Believe. It's the doctrinal statement of the Wells. goes through all the teachings of Scripture. Really neat and, and uh, very helpful to go through every once in a while. Until next time, may God bless you.